first of all, I'll present the group here. So we have uh, Louis Philippe Rabiard, we have Elwy McKnight, Dalal Hanna, and myself, Alex Bevington. Um, we're going to try to go a bit quickly, and then at the end, we'll have some live music and some videos that we'll try to show. Um, let's get on with it. So we left on this journey with a group of eight people and our trusty companion, uh, Yebo, the beautiful Husky Lab you see in the picture there. We were a group of four men and four women, all very good friends, all um, involved in various things, some people in the group being musicians, others being students, others being people that work, but all sharing a few common things. So. <laughs> <laughs> hmm, who knows? All sharing not only a passion for the outdoors, for the well-being of, of the environment, but also, of course, for adventure. So the journey began in Ottawa, where we left last April, and we departed from Ottawa and then paddled 7,000 kilometers in a northwesterly direction all the way to Inuvik in the Northwest Territories. Louis will talk to you a little bit more about the details of this route and some of the things we encountered in terms of itinerary along the way. So uh, to make it, to make it uh, quick, because it's a long route, we started from Ottawa, going up the Ottawa River, uh, then down the Matawa to North Bay, crossing Lake Nipissing onto the French River, uh, which led us to the Georgian Bay. And we went up to Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, and from there, we paddled along the North Shore, uh, of the Lake Superior, <laughs> to Thunder Bay. Uh, that led us to our big first obstacle. It's uh, the Grand Portage. It's a 14 kilometer portage. And uh, it was, uh, I mean, since we had been canoeing for like a month on Lake Superior, like basically not walking <laughs> and not carrying anything, uh, it was pretty rough. And it had been raining for a week, so. So <coughs> that led us to the Pigeon River, um, and then we made our way through the Boundary Waters, which I think a lot of you guys know about. Uh, we kept on going uh, until Winnipeg, and then we had to make a decision because we were running a bit short on time if we wanted to make it to Inuvik uh, before winter, which com comes quickly in the north. Uh, we you know, we, we had to, so we decided to skip Lake Winnipeg, took a train, which was amazing, <laughs> <laughs> after, after the, the paddling, to uh, the Paw, and then from the Paw we went up the North Saskatchewan to Cumberland Lake, then up the Sturgeon Weir, and then up the Churchill River, all the way up to the Methy Portage, which is a continental divide, uh, which led us from the Hudson Bay watershed to the Arctic watershed. Uh, it's a 21 kilometer portage, so that was a rough one too. <laughs> but it's pretty incredible that on you know a 7,000 kilometer route, there's only two big portages like this, just to show how much water there is in our country and how much it's important to you know preserve it. So. After the Metis Portage, we got on the Clearwater River down to Fort McMurray, then down the Athabasca, uh, across the Great Slave, and then down the Mackenzie for the last stretch, which led us to Inuvik uh, on, the, on the sea. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you. Uh, obviously, we're not the first people to take on this travel. There is a lot of people who did it before us, and uh, you know, starting with the, the First Nations, and it was really an honor for us to, to be traveling on the same routes. Uh, really humbling too, because I mean, we're traveling there with all our you know fancy gear and GPS and all these things, and to think that you know people were doing that. With nothing of that stuff, it's, you know, it's very humbling for us. So uh, There was a, lo a lot of traces of their passage on the way. Here we have uh, Agawa Rock on the northern shore of the Superior. The, the form that you see is called Mishipishu. In the 
Ojibwe mythology is the guardian of the Lake Superior, so it's one of the guardians. So, and here we have some fish drying in a little cabin uh, in the Northwest Territories. Above, you'll see a picture of us in a cabin at the same camp in the Northwest Territories. We're standing with a Metis elder, whom we had the pleasure of sitting in a circle with there. We discussed our trip with her and went on to share a circle talking about the trip and just enjoying her presence for the day. Then beside that, you see a picture of our, our very own attempt to build a smoker. In northern Saskatchewan, we crossed camps with smokers virtually every day along uh, the Churchill River. And we decided one day when we had an, after an afternoon off to try and build our own. We, smoked, we caught a number of fish and smoked a number of fish that day and enjoyed delicious fish for the next few days. But before all the fish had finished smoking, the smoker unfortunately caught on fire. <laughs> Thankfully, the river was very close, and we simply lifted it up and tossed it straight into the water. <laughs> so the voyage, I guess the, the journey that we took, was not only historically significant, but geographically significant as well. We crossed three major watersheds during the entire 6,000, 7,000 kilometer route. And very basically, a watershed can be defined as a geographic area in which all the water in that area eventually flows towards a larger body of water. So we started by crossing the Atlantic watershed, then the Hudson Bay, and then the Arctic. And of course, that would affect our daily paddling lives. So whether we were paddling upstream or downstream. Just to give you an idea, in the purple, the Arctic watershed there, that took us, oh, maybe a quarter of the length of the entire time we were gone, whereas that first watershed there took us, just on Lake Superior alone, we were on it for about a month and a little bit. So just to give you an idea of what it's like. And earlier on in the planning processes of this journey, um, as Dalal mentioned quickly earlier, we all have our own reasons for having undertaken this journey. Um, and we did want to place a common kind of goal, a common reason to why we did this journey, and that's where the concept of watersheds comes in. Um, we decided to basically focus on the importance of watershed conservation uh, for this journey. So Alex is going to explain why we chose watersheds. As you can imagine, we're a group of eight, so choosing a common cause to get us all out in the woods, and we wanted to support um, an NGO of sorts, um, was kind of tough. We all had we all had our own preferences or our own kind of causes that we hold to, dear to our hearts, but we found that in the watershed, um, we could find all of those causes. There was, there was the good, the bad, there was the urban, there was the wild, there was hunting, fishing, there's recreation outside, there's a uh, wilderness, there's um, ecosystems, pollution, there's everything. Everything is in the watershed. So we felt that this was an, something that brought together all of our opinions, all of our causes, and, and was, was really symbolic for kind of this scale of a trip because we go through so many different types of um, ecosystems. So we decided to affiliate ourselves with the uh, CEPAS, the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, and uh, the Ottawa Riverkeeper, because we're uh, based out of Ottawa. And we've been raising money and awareness for both of these organizations. We think they're very cool, and they do a lot of really good work. Um, and we encourage you to follow up on, on them if you, uh, if you don't know about them. So what you'll see here is a short video of our team packing up one morning on the Sturgeon on the Sturgeon Weir River in northern Saskatchewan. What's depicted here took, typically took us about two hours. Basically every morning, one person of the team would wake up before everyone else, wake everyone up, and start cooking breakfast on the fire for everyone. Once everyone had finished packing up, we'd meet around the fire, eat breakfast, and before we knew it, we were on the water. We'd stay on the water for anywhere between eight and 10 hours a day, stopping only about an hour for lunch. And then at the end of the day, find ourselves at the campsite where we take turns cooking supper, uh, setting up camp, and preparing lunches for the following day. And then before we knew it, the sun would set, as in the picture here, <laughs> and uh, we'd go to bed for the night. We'd wake up the next day to pretty much the exact same routine every day for about 165 days. But no, not every day was the same. There was always a little surprise every day that made it unique. Um, here I'll just uh, tell you a little story on the uh, Churchill River in northern Saskatchewan. We woke up one day and we were paddling on the water. It was very calm. There was no wind. It was still pretty early and we felt kind of at peace. We were in the wilderness. And uh, Louis, uh, first 
saw in the distance was pretty far away, but he saw an animal. He wasn't sure what it was, and we always tried to keep pretty quiet. But with four canoes, you have to tell the others to be quiet before we scare off the animal, right? So we thought it was a coyote at first, and then we got kind of gradually closer, trying to take pictures and paddle and not make so much motion to scare off the animal. Um, every time that we put our paddle back in the water, we thought that that motion would scare it off. So gradually we got closer and closer, and we realized it was a lynx. Um, and a lynx is not a very commonly seen animal in the woods. It's pretty timid. Um, and we got so close to this lynx, uh, I don't know if you can see it there, but it's just right in the woods, right there, um, that we could actually stare it in the eyes. Stare at this wild predator, right, right, right in the eyes. Um, and we just felt this sense of wilderness, this like, we're not wildlife photographers, we're not, you know, we, we just went out in the woods with some canoes and we, you really do um, find the wilderness when you, when you go far enough and that was really profound for us. Unfortunately, not all wildlife is as nice as the lynx. <laughs> when we first put our canoes onto the northern Saskatchewan River, I don't think we realized what it meant to be getting onto a river that's surrounded by a 20 kilometer buffer zone on either side of Sheer Swamp. Uh, in addition to that, this summer was particularly hefty on the flood, so it was quite wet. And what, wait, what likes the wet? Mosquitoes do. So there were so many mosquitoes on the northern Saskatchewan River that when you'd try and get into your tent at the end of the day to get to bed, in the fraction of a minute that you would take to get into your tent, just as quick as you could, somehow, Thousands of mosquitoes would still find their way into your tent. You had to spend at least 10 to 15 minutes killing all the mosquitoes that had somehow gotten into your tent. And then just as you're about to fall asleep, peace at the end of the day at last, you start to hear a buzzing sound. And you realize that your entire tent is actually covered with mosquitoes. I'm not exaggerating. Um, so much so that sometimes if you have the misfortune of turning over in the middle of the night and putting your hand on the nylon that separates you and the outdoors world, you'd wake up with hundreds of bites all over your hand or your forehead. It got so bad one night on the North Saskatchewan that uh, the team kind of just got to the site and gave up. We didn't have supper. We simply set up our tents and went to bed, <laughs> chomped on a granola bar and disappeared out of the outdoors where it was extremely hard during that period of time. But. Not all the wildlife was like mosquitoes. All right, so here's a little clip of two black bear cubs. Here, we're, in this footage, we're paddling upstream on the North Saskatchewan River. And these two cubs, we spotted them. We're lucky enough to turn on the camera pretty quick. They're crossing the river, and they're being swept towards us um, by the current. So they eventually come to within maybe a, a paddle stroke or two. Their backs are covered with mosquitoes, too. You can see them a little bit there. Mother bear was nowhere to be seen. We were very happy about, well, kind of nervous actually, anxious that we didn't see her, but uh, probably a good thing too. So. so we got the chance to see several other large uh, mammals. Um, we did see many moose. You'll see there's a shot of a moose in the next slide here. But uh, this shot was taken on the shores, I think of the Athabasca or the Mackenzie River. And there's a combination of black bear uh, no grizzly bear paws, but black bear, uh, wolf, and a couple deer and moose tracks in there. We didn't have the chance to see a wolf, They're very furtive animals. Um, our dog, Yebo, did unfortunately get attacked by wolves in the Northwest Territories, but luckily he recovered very well. We found him and, and uh, took care of him, and he recovered extremely well, so we were very lucky for that. Just uh, another animal we saw. So a lot of people wonder why we did this trip, what was the, the motive, other than the watersheds, which is kind of our cause, is, is what drives eight young 20-year-olds to get out in the woods for six months or so. Um, I guess you all are avid outdoors men and women, so we don't have to explain the beauty of the outdoors, but for us it was a complete detachment. Uh, just getting out in the woods for that extent of time is, is so healthy. Um, you sleep well at night. You eat well because you're hungry, because you've been working all day. Um, most of us in the city, or I'm speaking for myself maybe, uh, I don't fare too well in the city, I don't sleep much, I work too much, and I don't eat super well. So this was a good way to be healthy and remind ourselves that uh, the outdoors has very uh, a good effect on you. Um, but 
there's a lot of challenges that come with it. So on this type of adventure, uh, challenges come daily. These can be physical, emotional, mental. They're of all kinds. One of the biggest challenges I felt on this trip was towards the end of the trip when we reached uh, the Mackenzie River in October. And the cold started kicking in. Every day it got colder. And it was anywhere between minus 5 and minus 12 every day, all the time, on the water. Early October, as we uh, approached the Rampard Rapids on the Mackenzie River, the canoe I was in, <laughs> unfortunately, hit the rapids the wrong way. And we tipped. No dry suits, no wet suits. This definitely pushed cold to the next level for myself, but thankfully we got out of it and uh, stayed warm after that. <laughs> Challenges were not only for ourselves, but also for Yebo. Uh, at some point during the journey, we noticed that Yebo had some sort of cut on himself, and, on, and we were wondering what it was, what it could be. Eventually, we decided that we should maybe explore this. What we found was a little maggot's head poking out of Yebo's body. This is us pulling the maggot out with a leatherman. Yebo had unfortunately been, uh, had an egg laid on him by a botfly, and uh, this egg then turns into a larvae that pokes its way out from the inside. Challenges can also be physical. This here is a picture of Alex, who had to unfortunately leave the trip for about a month and a half when uh, we discovered one day that he had a hernia. Hernias were one of the most typical injuries or causes of death amongst the voyagers because this type of trip is extremely strenuous. In the Toronto to fix it. Other challenges, I guess, um, we could include water in that. So for the entire five and a half months, uh, we were able to basically pull out the water that we were paddling on and either treat it with our filter or with pristine or boil it. And this was the case except for two places during the entire journey, and that was in Ontario, uh, just south, uh, or just past Fort Francis, actually, uh, downstream of a few paper and pulp mills, and then also downstream of the Athabasca oil sands, which are in northern Alberta, and we were suggested not to drink that water for at least 500 kilometers uh, downstream of that location. So. Um, we took precautions to try and do that, and unfortunately, some challenges uh, that are associated with water are illnesses and bacteria, which is why we were treating. So, if, I guess a few of us perhaps uh, contracted Giardia during the trip, and only found out maybe 30 days later. So, those are some other physical challenges. <coughs> uh, another uh, thing that we had to face on a very day-to-day -day basis is the fact that we were traveling a group of eight people. Um, everybody pretty hard-headed, too. <laughs> uh, and so we, we decided before, before leaving for the trip during the, the preparation that we, we didn't want any um, team leader or chief or you know any, anybody who would take the, the final decision for everybody. So. We were always working by consensus uh, and compromise, which uh, takes a l an awful lot of time <laughs> when, when y you have eight people, you know, r holding on to their opinion. So it was in itself a very good learning process, um, you know, learn how to live with other people, which is something that we can really carry out, uh, you know, in in our everyday life after that. Um, yeah, and <laughs> not only were we eight people, but we were also four couples. So, you know, that brings another kind of dynamic too in the, you know, there's group problems and there are smaller group problems and that. <laughs> Anyways, but everybody made it out alive. <laughs> everybody made it out alive and uh, yeah. <laughs> So just quickly, um, I think it's important to, after doing a trip like this, to pull out what you learned from it and kind of try to synthesize that in your own head. And, I, and the one thing that I think we'll share with you that I think is common to all of us is that we love the fact that we were able to do this. We're not all canoe professionals or we don't have these huge his historical, uh, we haven't been doing it for years and years and years but you can go through all the rivers in Canada and you can portage around the dams that are there. You can make it through the places that have been uh, clear cut and you, you can do it. And we want to see, um, we, we would love it if this was always possible. You could always, a group of young, or a group of anyone, you know, go out into the woods for six months, whatever your route, and be able to do it. No one's stopping you, no one's, so it's just that kind of freedom of being outdoors and everything that's good that comes with it. So 
what we're doing now is we're trying to synthesize all the photos and the videos and the stories. Um, meanwhile, half of us are back in university or working jobs or planning another trip. So we're trying to make a little documentary, um, which we'll show in a minute, um, and also a bit of live music. Um, and I forgot about this slide where we wanted to thank everyone along the way because we stayed in a lot of homes. Uh, we met so many people who extended an extremely helping, uh, helpful hand, um, bringing in eight dirty, smelly canoe, canoeists and their dog <laughs> into the house uh, and helping us out. So this wouldn't have been possible with everyone, including our sponsors. One of those people is uh, Chris Main, who actually presented earlier today and is here today. So he took us in. He didn't know us. And uh, when we arrived in North Bay, he was nice of us to have us in his house. So a big thank you to you, Chris, for that. Believe it or not, we're going to squeeze in one last video as well, um, with live music this time, because for uh, most of the trip we had a uh, guitar and a violin with us, because there was a guitarist and a violinist, um, and harmonicas and all that kind of stuff, and we did play a lot of music and wrote a lot of songs, so they'll, write, they'll sing to you an original uh, song, uh, com accompanied with a bit of uh, video. I feel like Madonna. <laughs> tried so hard. <laughs>
Prends garde sur le sentier, il y a des trous et des serpents cachés. Et des oubliettes sans fenêtre sur le passé. Et des bras de bois qui gifflent et qui enchaînent à chaque fois. À chaque Il y a des visions sauvages et des ombres sans visage. Qu'on voit danser sur la roche en robe de mariage. De So what you see on the screen here is our project's website. Um, the little clips that you just saw are kind of the beginning of what will eventually become a documentary. So if you're interested in staying posted on our project, we are holding a certain number of events. We're still trying to raise some funds for not only CPAWS, but also to make our future goals possible. Please take the time to visit our website, sign up to our blog, check out our blogs from the summer. It'd be a pleasure to have you on board. Thanks for listening.